Tarun, many thanks for joining us today. Nice to be with you, Mini. You know, Tarun, it's very interesting. You know, uh, since last February, we've been doing a series uh, of, of shows, articles, etc., about the making of modern India and the run-up to India at 75. And what I found uh, uh, interesting in the book, uh, Leadership to Last, which is the book that you've just co-authored uh, with Jeffrey Jones uh, from Harvard, is the fact that many of the leaders that you talk about or, or companies that you talk about actually help shape the economy of India or shape uh, their, their own sectors and hence played a very pivotal role in the making of modern India. So I want to start, of course, you have uh, uh, Ratan Tata, you have uh, YK Hamid uh, from CIPLA, you have Rahul Bajaj, you have, uh, you know, the Murukappa Group uh, chairman, uh, former chairman, MB Subaya. I want to start by asking you, the brief of this book was, of course, to look at these leaders and the companies and and, and the mantra of leadership in conjunction with other leaders in the emerging market, right? Uh, so what made you choose on, on, on this cohort of people uh, for this book? So many, that's a good question. Um, uh, to contextualize, I mean, these um, uh, interview extracts on the basis of which Jeff, Jeff Jones and I wrote this, wrote this book uh, are from a much broader repository of video interviews that Jeff and I and a lot of colleagues at Harvard have been doing for the past 15 years across about 25 different emerging markets, including and importantly India, of course, uh, but not limited to India. Uh, the book itself, Leadership to Last, um, is targeted primarily at an audience in India and South Asia to profile a selection of what I would call iconic entrepreneurs who, as your introduction just suggested, have really reshaped the contours of the societies in which they operate. So it's primarily stories from India, um, but also some from other countries in South Asia, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, and a smattering from other parts of the world, Brazil, South Africa, Philippines, um, Indonesia, you name it where we thought we saw some resonance with the stories that we were profiling in India. The actual repository is considerably larger. This is just an extract to hopefully whet people's appetite and give some sense of how fundamental and how foundational the actions of these really gutsy, courageous, creative people have been in, in shaping, as you say, a modern societies. And many of these uh entrepreneurs and companies have weathered uh, quite a few storms as well, because India is a work in progress. And in the period that we are looking at 1900 to 2000, it was, there was so much happening. So I'm going to start with the, the group that has, uh, you know, is even older than that, because it's 150 years old, over 150 years old. I'm talking about the Tata group. You spent considerable time with Ratan Tata. And uh, I, I saw clips of the interview with him. It was very insightful, lots of learnings about how India has changed. But what stood out for you? What has allowed the Tatars to remain at the top of the heap for so long uh, as they navigated through the colonial period, the, the early years of independence, the license permit Raj, the opening up of the economy, and now they're again in the forefront of technology? It's a really interesting question and one that, you know, over the uh, last 30 years that I've been teaching at Harvard, I've had many occasions to reflect. Uh, Ratan in particular has been extremely generous with his time, not just to me, but to a whole bunch of us uh, colleagues at Harvard. Um, and I, I remember first meeting him, I think probably in this context, probably in the early 1990s. Uh, and throughout, and including in this interview that you're alluding to many, what really comes across when you sit with him is a deeply reflective, uh, deeply humanistic personality, if you will, for want of a better adjective to describe him, uh, very much uh, geared towards uh, trying to put himself in your shoes, trying to understand where you're coming from, um, and trying to build something collaboratively with you, whether it's an intellectual work product in the case of talking to an academic like myself, uh, or something entrepreneurial, or something that takes along you know, the rank and file of the Tata Enterprises. I think what stands out, not just during Ratan's tenure as, uh, as, uh, as chairman of the group, uh, but his predecessors, at least as he and others in the Tata group recounted uh, to us, um, is a deep sense of 
a commitment to India and commitment to institution building uh, beyond, um, uh, of course, companies have to be viable and companies have to return uh, adequate returns to their shareholders, uh, but really uh, embracing the idea that uh, they are stewards of um, uh, societal memory in different ways and shapers of, as you would put it, modern India, creating the institutions, whether you go back to you know, Air India, which is now back in their possession, or you go to the Institute of Science or uh, TIFR or the Tata Trust now, you see their fingerprints so constructively, uh, by and large, uh, across so many swaths of Indian society over decades and decades. So I think it's that commitment to institution building in the country uh, and perhaps overlaid with a deeply ethical and moral compass uh, that really stands out. And those are timeless qualities. And those are, uh, you know, if you will, weather vanes or moral compasses or whatever you want to call them that allow you to navigate all forms of turbulence. And as you rightly say, India is a work in progress. Most emerging markets are works in progress. You only have to look out of the proverbial window now to see um, how we're all being buffeted by the winds of change as we go along. And unless you have some, um, you know, a compass, to guide you through this, uh, it's very hard to see how you survive and contribute for such long periods of time. Uh, so to me, it yeah. really is emblematic of the uh, point yeah. of view. Which is very interesting because, you know, uh, I remember talking to Firoza Godzwich, who's a historian uh, and done a lot of work on the history of the community, the Parsis. And she said that a lot of the community looks up to Jamshedji Tata because he set the tone, so to say. And in many respects, you know, uh, uh, we, we often refer to the Tatas as the salt to hotels, but now salt to digital, uh, you know, <laughs> retail platform kind of a conglomerate. But you think, uh, is there any other parallel in the in the emerging world of, of a company or a group that straddles such a vast spectrum? And w one could argue that, you know, why should, I mean, it, it kind of turns on its head every aspect of good management, you know, focus and backward integration or having related businesses this is a different beast, so to say. Uh, you know, the short answer, Mini, is that there are there are lots of examples. Uh, by lots, I mean, you know, you could count them on the fingers of two hands, but there's not just one. I mean, one is profiled in the book. It's another extremely good friend of mine, uh, Jaime, uh, Jaime, Jaime Ayala, Jaime Zubel Augusto Ayala is his full name. Um, he is maybe the fifth or sixth or seventh, I forget now, generation running the Ayala group, which I think of as the Tata of the Philippines in some sense. Um, and again, you see the same thing. You see a commitment to institution building, um, recognition that that can coexist with a moral compass and coexist with handsome shareholder returns, so to speak. Um, tentacles in every part of Filipino life and Southeast Asian life, embracing new technologies as they come up. Uh, but also staying in some of the traditional real estate, uh, basic finance, and so on as you go along. So there are a lot of these. And, you know, my colleague uh, Krishna Palipu and I back in, I want to say, 1997, partly as a result, actually, as it turns out, of a couple of conversations with Ratan Tara, uh, came up with this theory of um, uh, how it made sense for companies in developing countries to, unlike those in the developed uh, world, so to speak, to compensate for institutional inadequacies in their environment. Precisely because, as you said, these are all works in progress, countrywide works in progress. Um, and in doing so, develop some core assets that could be leveraged across what we might otherwise think of as very unrelated lines of business. So that's the genesis of this notion that you have these very diversified, sprawling, octopusy-like groups. But it just means that uh, we shouldn't rush to the conclusion that they are intrinsically problematic. In fact, we have some pretty compelling uh, econometric evidence that we published over the years that say they're anything but uh, in either irrelevant, they're certainly not anachronistic, and they are even efficiency enhancing in the particular context in which they find themselves. And lastly, what I would say is that uh, being sprawling doesn't mean that the individual businesses are not super focused, right? So TCS is super focused. Um, so is, um, you know, Titan, uh, making watches and jewelry and so on. Um, but it coexists within a larger structure whose genesis I think can be seen as almost a, a mirror to the institutional inadequacies of, uh, of, uh, of the developing country where they're formed. 
Uh, so short answer, many there are a lot of these, uh, and they tend that's to be really interesting. And that's quite insightful because you know um, you're absolutely right. Almost every bit of the expansion was to keep pace with the changing face of India, right, and also fill a gap. So uh, that's really interesting. But what is also interesting is the fact, the point that you make that most emerging market companies are family owned, and you believe that family owned businesses actually have a, a, a higher chance of success in the long term, which is interesting. Now, I'm going to talk about the Murugappa group, for instance, not as big as the Tatas, but a substantial group in the south of India and a hugely traditional group also. Uh, proud, and, and I've had uh, Mr. Subaya, uh, you know, talk to us uh, uh, on the Chetiars, his community, and how they kind of evolved uh, business and business ideas. It's fascinating, but it's so rooted in that. And yet, they are there, out there, in, in the forefront. So do you think that rootedness in tradition has also helped some of these companies? Oh, very much so. Very much so. In fact, I would go so far as to say is that if your objective is to create a long-lived enterprise, you better be rooted in a tradition. And if you don't have one and you can't find one, then create one. You need a tradition that anchors things. And it may even be a made-up tradition. Now, in the case of the... Uh, Chetiar community, it's a set of traditions and practices and uh, belief systems uh, that long predate the Murugappa group the way we see it today, and of which they are beneficiaries and stewards going forward. Uh, and in the interview, if I remember correctly, M.V. Subaya uh, does an amazing job of tracing generations of his forebears uh, and how their various activities laid the foundational blocks of what ultimately became the Murugappa group in this country and how they've remained true to the ethos even though the initial businesses on which the group was founded, where the initial capital accumulation probably occurred, uh, may not even exist anymore. Um, but the point is that uh, the traditions and the folklore uh, of the enterprise that bound it together uh, uh, were sort of gestated in that period and now have manifested in different forms. And that's exactly what you should see. You should see enterprises reshape and reform, uh, take what is timeless, uh, and re reinterpret it in the context of the current, you know, socioeconomic and technological milieus in which they find themselves, uh, which is what Murugappa has done very well. Uh, and again, they are not alone. Yeah, absolutely. And we will talk about the Bajajas, but in another context later. But tell me, uh, you know, these groups are outliers, Tarot, because if you look at Indian business, you know, if you look at the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, most of the big companies, which were known for the surnames that they were called by, don't exist anymore. So it's been lethal. They've been wiped out, you know. So, uh, yes, family-owned businesses did well in India. Traditionally, that's the format used because business is fam family enterprises here. But there's so many who became almost synonymous with the corruption of the license permit Raj. What do you think uh, that period was like and how did these groups kind of maneuver or, or uh, you know, uh, sidestep the issues that were faced at that time? Oh, Mini, in, this, uh, in these sentences, you've asked so many questions. So let me... It's a wide <laughs> spectrum. <laughs> let me peel that on in a little bit. Uh, the first, the, the, the opening uh, uh, salvo in that uh, set of questions was a comment about lack of longevity, right? And, I, you know, that's the norm. Um, and lack of longevity need not have anything to do with corruption um, or need not even intrinsically be bad from a societal standpoint. Because think about it. What is it that you want? You want some smart man or woman to get up one day and realize that there's something creative he or she can do in that society. And then they do it and they earn some returns for it and they benefit some people by employing them. And when that task is done, um, there's really no reason for them to continue to exist. So the default ought to be that these enterprises don't necessarily have to survive. Uh, the resources that they command um, get distributed to people who contributed uh, to the creation of that enterprise. And then whatever is left over gets redistributed to the next smart cookie who shows up and says, now I know how to reinterpret things. And that's a normal process. Uh, you know, I mean, Schumpeter, uh, uh, you know, a former, if you may say, a colleague at Harvard in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, very famously called it uh, creative destruction and so on and so forth. Um, but that's a fact of life and that's the norm. And it's no different in India than it is in the United States. 
I think what's interesting about the companies in, uh, uh, in our Creating Emerging Markets video database, uh, as well as in the Leadership to Last book, from, which draws from that database, uh, is that these entities that we're profiling um, have done something more foundational than simply earn a return uh, on capital or a return on labor uh, inputs. Um, they have really created lasting foundational building blocks for society. And that's what we're trying to direct attention to. Right? It's not so much the longevity per se of the enterprise. Longevity of a badly run enterprise in a corrupt society may be a really bad thing. Here we're saying this longevity is pretty cool. It's amazing because it's something that um, some smart man or woman said, this is what you know my country needs uh, in this time and place. And I see an opportunity to build it and I'm going to build it in a way that um, um, respect, you know, represents stewardship of resources. Uh, the second question that you asked was about um, those that thrive in the uh, license Raj. Uh, you're exactly right. I mean, there is a, a lot of scholarship about companies that did very well in the past. Um, by and large, those whose success was predicated entirely on manipulating the license Raj, of which we know there were many, um, you know, appropriately vanished when the license Raj weakened. And that's what you expect to see. And that's what we did see. Uh, some who did benefit from the license Raj re reinvented themselves when they realized uh, there were societal, societal winds were changing uh, and re-emerged as perfectly reasonable entities uh, doing good things um, in the modern time. But again, my default is that companies should not expect to last, nor should they want to uh, perpetuate themselves simply for the sake of perpetuation. Of course, that's not how people think. People want to perpetuate themselves, but that's not how it should be necessarily. Right. That, that's an interesting point. I want to shift gear out of the family-owned businesses to technocrat-led businesses, right? I mean, this is normally seen as a phenomenon that happened uh, with the opening of the IT sector, but there were sectors where this happened a generation ahead and not just in the IT sector. And the two sectors that I'd like to talk about are, uh, of course, uh, the pharmaceutical sector and the FMCG sector. Now, the Godridges are as blue-blooded family-owned businesses as they come through, you know, into multiple generations. But actually, the secret of the Godridge success has been a very sharp focus on innovation, on, on what a technocrat would do rather than what an inheritor would do. So I would like you to expand on that. So it's an interesting descrip description of the, of the Godrej group. Um, you know, um, uh, Adi also and Jamshed and others have been very generous with their time with us over the, uh, over the decades. And Nisa, who I think currently is the chairperson of the group, was, was in my class as a student many years ago. So I'm trying to reflect on whether that's the characterization that I would have offered of the group. Um, Right. You know, you, 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 may, you may be right. I mean, if I think about the safes going back when, or the soaps, um, uh, or the, uh, the chemistry of hair dyes, uh, <laughs> or what have you, um, uh, or even currently gold-rich consumer products, there is a lot of technology and a lot of engineering that goes into it. Um, and of course, at least some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, people who have been running the gold -rich group, different branches of it, uh, have been educated in very technically centric institutions. I remember Adi said, I think he went to MIT, which we won't hold against him. Um, uh, and so there is a sense in which that's probably right. Uh, now, I'm trying to think about how representative that is of uh, groups in India. Um, and I'm not sure I, 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 I'm not sure I could offer a characterization of whether it's normal or not. It, it, it is an outlier in that sense, I think. I mean, you know. And what it, what, one thing that it does say, Mini, I think, is that uh, being, uh, being a technophile is not inconsistent with being, quote unquote, a traditional family, having a traditional family orientation, which I think is an important point. Um, by the way, you know, most U.S. businesses are family businesses, uh, the way we define them. Uh, it's just that there are probably more of them in the developing countries than there are even in the 
That's right. So. And they're also corporatized. I mean, uh, I mean, Walmart is a classic example of, of being corporatized even in Sam Walton's lifetime, which is amazing. In India, you know, it is the third, fourth generation that's trying to kind of get that in. And we've spoken about this in the past, Tarun. But I'm going to um, now move to YK Hamid. And I think, um, you know, no story on uh, the making of modern India can can uh, be uh, done justice to without talking about Yusuf Hamid, um, who is larger than life in every aspect. But in the 90s, he was literally taking on the world's largest pharmaceutical companies with his, his AIDS cocktail, which kind of, uh, you know, uh, played a pivotal role in, 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 uh, in solving the problem of, of, of uh, AIDS. And he has been at the forefront. And, you know, while we talk about IT, we talk about, uh, you know, the great consumption of India, the great marketplace that is India. We don't adequately uh, lay emphasis on this particular aspect of India uh, being the center for global or finding the answers for global problems. So I do want you to reflect on Hamid's story. I think it's a wonderful point. And you saw that, by the way, with uh, uh, Adar and Punawala's and the Sarum Institute in the current crisis, um, and being one of the center, cent, you know, central places where vaccines for the world of all sorts are produced. Um, you know, India is to some extent the pharmacy of the world. And as time passes, uh, we in India are becoming more sophisticated about novel formulations also, as opposed to um, focusing on the factory processes to produce others' formulations better. Uh, but Yusuf Hamid is, um, as you say, larger than life character. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking to him on more than one occasion, including sitting down with him because he's so full of life and so energized and so um, um, emotionally and viscerally connected to the development of India's story, you know, going back to his, uh, his father and perhaps even before that, and the legacy uh, of the Hamid family in thinking about what their activities mean for the creation of modern India right? in their own time and place. I think going back to at least 1930s, if not before. Right. Um, so it really, it, and it, it also reminds me of the point we were just making with the gold bridges, that if you look at uh, Yusuf Bai, um, you know, he's a, he's a real scientist. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he's uh, as scientifically minded as any scientist I've, I've met. His office is stacked with, uh, you know, um, uh, magazines and uh, journals on organic chemistry and physical chemistry. And that's really where the ideas are coming from for better processes. So it's, it's genuine scientific advance. It shouldn't be poo-pooed or minimized as process engineering, whereas, you know, the real scientific stuff was done somewhere else. To me, it's every bit as legitimate, uh, a contribution to the science of pharmaceutical making uh, as was the original drug formulation, uh, if the objective is to be the pharmacy to the world, which of course is his objective. And that's the sense in which, as you pointed out, uh, India is playing a role in that sector of addressing problems all over the world. So it's, you know, it's one of my favorite stories uh, in, uh, in the book, uh, just because it started in life, it's courageous, it's like a soap opera, <laughs> it's life and death. It's, uh, it's lawsuits, it's excitement, it's uh, and also it's a, a, a torch bearer what India can be. You know, I mean, I think that's totally, every time I've met him, I've been totally inspired by him. But, you know, this is a nice side of business, right? This is the, the, the great vision of individuals and groups uh, and the gumption with which they have gone ahead. But there is another side. India remained, even after liberalization, one of the most bureaucratic countries in the world. I mean, and that's really putting the shackles on in on enterprise. And I think what stood out for me was Jerry Rao's interview and, and the layers of regulatory approvals that he spoke about to get one residential project off the ground. Now, he's a great guy, too. Uh, because he was uh, one of India's most successful bankers, he headed city, then he went out and he, you know, did so many interesting things first with the technology with emphasis, and then with uh, low cost housing and then with uh, real estate development. Uh, so what were the insights you got from him? Because, you know, the both the sides, I mean, look at the banks, you know, it's again a huge issue with the PSU banks, you know, dominating the spectrum and the whole corruption over there. Uh, that has been manifested and so visible with the collapse over the last couple of years and this regulatory framework. So when you look at that, I mean, what insights did you get 
on India from his story? Well, you know, with Jerry, there's never a dull moment, um, uh, as you as, as, as you know. Um, you know, and he's a little bit of a, I don't know, a poet or a writer at heart. So he has a very, uh, you know, uh, evocative way of describing situations that might otherwise seem prosaic. And I, what sticks out to me, I don't remember the exact words, but I think the way he described it was that India is like a, um, you know, like, like a, uh, you can think of the rules and regulations as being layers of sediment, you know, one on top of the other. Uh, every, you know, generation or epoch comes along and adds a new rule, but everybody forgets to take the previous one away. And nobody bothers about the inconsistencies between things that have been introduced at different times. And so you've got laws in the books that go back to the early 1900s that don't make any sense now, but they're just there. And they add uh, enormous amounts of uh, procedural ease as well as ambiguity to getting simple things done. By the way, that's still true. That's still true. I know we like to say that we simplify things a great deal and we have in many dimensions, uh, but goodness me, is it ever a work in progress in India still? Um, and he's pointing out that uh, if we were just more as a society disciplined about dealing with these uh, anachronistic, well-intentioned but anachronistic uh, rules and regulations, we would reduce the ambiguity and inconsistency across uh, across. Uh, or at least the perceived uh, inconsistency across the rules that entrepreneurs uh, experience. And that in turn would remove uh, a, you know, a powerful way in which uh, those uh, in, the, uh, in the regulatory side who are interested in using that for their own advantage for corrupt purposes, that would you know, remove the possibility of their doing so if things were crystal clear. And you can see that you know, when Nandan and his... Uh, band of married men and women introduce Aadhaar, the unique ID, it's really made things much more transparent in so many walks of life and reduced corruption a great deal. There's lots of good evidence on that. Um, so I think if you see Jerry's interview and Nandan's interview in juxtaposition to each other, you see Jerry basically saying this is a fundamental problem. If only it were done thus and so, it would be better. Nandan comes along many years later and does Aadhaar with his team of men, Ram Sevak Sharma and others. And lo and behold, you see exactly what you should see. Um, so it's that idea of layering of rules and regulations without removing the past that I think sticks out to me from uh, Jerry's description. Right. We had a detailed interview with Nandan on, on the making of Aadhaar, so to say, and how yes. technology can, can be such a, have such a great impact in, in solving problems. You know, um, the last set of questions, uh, Tarun, you know, we've gone through very quickly some of these interesting people uh, and their role in the making of modern India, so to say, through the company and the works that they did. On the whole, you know, we often look at India as part of the Southeast Asia network or the uh, emerging market network. How do you, I mean, it's such a sweeping generalization, but are there any um, cardinal or principles that govern good business in India. I mean, for example, in South Korea, you have the chairbills, you know, the, the great uh, family-owned conglomerates who control business. In China, you have the big state-owned companies who continue to uh, rule. In India, it's a smattering of all kinds. It's almost as diverse as the country itself. So as uh, an academic teaching a course in India, what do you tell your students who haven't uh, been to India, not from India, about business in India? So I think... Um... Uh, it's, a, it's a very sweeping and, uh, question, but also a very good question. Um, I mean, I think there's some things that are not unique to India that I think are characteristics of any, as you put it at the beginning of this conversation, work in progress, uh, as any developing country is. And that is uh, the fact that many of the institutions that we take for granted in Boston, where I'm sitting right now, um, are works in progress themselves. And when, you know, Devi Shetty says, I want to be a pediatric cardiac surgeon, that's what he really wants to be. He wants to be a pediatric cardiac surgeon. But the fact is that to do it well in an environment where there are so many kids who don't have uh, the requisite surgery, he has to do it at scale. And the fact is that to do it at scale, he has to rely on satellite-based telemedicine. He has to rely on medical insurance. He has to rely on logistics. He has to rely on a massive number of uh, paramedics and nurses and profusionists and what have you, none of whom exist in adequate numbers. So he's got to go and do all these things. And that's not what he wants to do. He wants to be a pediatric cardiac surgeon. He's got to do all these things because those institutions don't exist. Now, over time, 
as they come into being, he can stop doing it if he wants and become, you know, just a focused cardiac surgeon. But the point that I'm trying to make with that example is that what's common to both India and to Indonesia and South Africa and Brazil and China is that the, the set of institutional inadequacies differs from place to place and time to time. And it becomes the task of the entrepreneur to contribute to the institution building. It's useless to say that that should have been built by the government. Of course, that's true. It should have been built by the government. But the government, who is the government? The government is us. The government is a reflection of us. So if we don't have it, we have only ourselves to blame or our four, forefathers and four parents to blame, so to speak. So the entrepreneur has to get up and roll up his or her sleeves and just get on with it and do it. Um, and it turns out that that's what these people have all done. And that's common to all the examples in India. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say is that um, it doesn't, it pays to be socially conscious. It actually improves the bottom line to be socially conscious. I'm, I'm, you know, I wanted to believe that before embarking, you know, on this long-standing study that I began in the mid-2000s with my book on China and India. I wanted to believe that, but now after 15, 20 years of doing that, I believe it very deeply. It actually pays to do the right thing. It's a wonderful thing, actually. I, I just wish more people thought of it that way and, and, you know, took that message. And if there's one message that this conversation, this book should kind of underline is that, that, you know, good pays and, you know, stick with it. My last it question, really, yeah, absolutely. My last question, you know, um, in 2008, uh, you wrote a book on uh, uh, the billionaires that or the entrepreneurs that are, emerging, the billion entrepreneurs that are emerging in India and China and how that's going to reshape the world. And I think I, I first met you soon after that, uh, that book was out. It was a, a game changer because nobody had thought of India as a, as a place for a billion entrepreneurs to come out, right? I mean, or, or of any sizable uh, um, number. In the last couple of years, it's all about entrepreneurship, Tarun. It's, it's reworking the entire idea of business in India. And now you have unicorns and God knows why they're unicorns because they don't have the bottom line or the top line for it, but they are. But how do you see this phase in India's journey? I mean, you think uh, this is going to, with so many entrepreneurs looking at so many problems uh, and solving them, do you think, uh, you know, it's going to allow India to leapfrog? What is your assessment? Oh, I think we're at the beginning of an explosion of this. Um, I mean, this is what I was trying to call attention to uh, in 2008 with that book and a prior article that I wrote with a Chinese colleague, uh, Wang Yasheng, in 2003, just to say that the fundamentals are in place. And if you take the long view, which I should as an academic, as opposed to respond to the here and now only, uh, it's pretty clear this is going to happen. Uh, it's just a question of whether it happens in five, 15 years, or five years, or 10 years, or 15 years. And it's pretty much rolled out according to script. Um, and I think we're just at the beginning of this. I think you'll see an explosion. You know, some years ago, the government asked me to write a policy report on uh, an entrepreneurial framework for India, which is at some level a Sisyphean large task. Uh, but that resulted in the creation of this Atal Innovation Mission, which sits in Niti Aayog and has become sort of the centerpiece of at least the government's attempts to trigger some change. Um, and to create a platform for uh, private entrepreneurs to build on top of. And I think it's changes like that that will act as wind in the sails uh, of this entrepreneurial ship that has sailed now. And I'm very bullish on it. I'm very optimistic about it. Uh, so uh, I hope it continues and I hope it uh, you know, uh, goes up by a factor of 10 and then some. And uh, I think it's for the good of society. Great, Tarun. Always such a pleasure to talk to you. Many Thank thanks you. for joining us and uh, all the very best on the book. I mean, it's a fantastic read. And I think what it does also is that it puts in context similar journeys across, you know, and I think that just adds a very nice dimension to this book. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Mini, for talking about it. So. Thank you.